Please welcome the President and Chief Executive Officer for PBS, Paula Kerger. Thank you and good afternoon. What a wonderful afternoon. This is my first trip to beautiful Mackinac Island and I'd like to thank the Detroit Regional Chamber and PNC Bank for inviting me to be with you today. Last spring, I had the opportunity to speak before the Detroit Economic Club and I'm honored to return to Michigan for this renowned gathering. Now as president of PBS, I stand here representing 350 locally owned and operated public television stations, including Michigan's own Detroit Public Television, CMU Public Television, WKAR in East Lansing, WNMU in Marquette, WGVU in Grand Rapids, and Delta Broadcasting. Uh, for the record, I needed two cups of coffee to get through all those call letters. I commend the leaders in this room for focusing on a topic that has great importance, not just for Michigan, but also for our country, restoring confidence in American institutions, including the media. Now, restoring is the operative word because the long-held compact between the public and media has fractured. A PBS NewsHour Marist poll fielded earlier this year found that less than one-third of Americans have confidence in the media, down from two-thirds five decades ago. To understand what's behind this erosion in trust, it's important to consider the landscape. In the history of media, there have been periods of great transformation. The advent of radio and television, the explosion of the internet. But perhaps no period has been more volatile than the last decade. In this age of disruption, the media industry has undergone tectonic shifts with mergers and acquisitions resulting in a handful of conglomerates that have extraordinary influence over the content that consumers see, read, and hear. Many of these organizations have become fragmented and targeted in their approach, thus enabling consumers to curate the news based on our own personal biases. Concurrently, media has become less local and more national. Local market media is now largely controlled by companies that have no connection to the markets they serve. In fact, in many places that I visit, public television and public radio stations are the last locally owned and operated <laughs> broadcasters. Due to changing revenue models and evolving technologies, the number of people working in newsrooms has dropped by almost half in the last quarter century. Look no further than the award-winning Detroit Free Press and the Detroit News. While they continue to do great work, from the Kwame Patrick coverage to the Detroit bankruptcy, those institutions have seen a significant reduction in editorial staff. Meanwhile, the rise of social media, coupled with propaganda masked as news, has created a dangerous blurring between fact and point of view. Certain truths that were once irrefutable are now subject to distortion, making it more challenging for people to discern what is real and what is not. All of this has contributed to a decline in trust. The consequence of skepticism is a cancer. Left unchecked, it will only deepen the polarization and division that exists in America today. When people lose trust in media, we lose our capacity to bring light to the pressing issues facing our society, and we lose our ability to hold leaders in all sectors accountable. Despite the erosion in trust, public television has defied the downward trend. This year, for the 15th year in a row, PBS and our local stations were rated the most trusted public institution in America. As a sign of our strong bond, a bipartisan survey fielded in 2017 found that seven in 10 American voters strongly support federal funding for public broadcasting. Now granted, we have a different business model than our commercial counterparts. However, we still operate in the same challenging landscape and I believe that there are insights from our work in public media that have universal application. I'd like to share some ways in which we can begin together to restore trust in media. First and foremost, we re rebuild trust by relentlessly pursuing the truth. Unfortunately, we live in an age when fake news has been part of the everyday vernacular. A recent Gallup Knight Foundation survey found that Americans believe it is now harder to be well-informed and to know what news is accurate. The truth can be elusive, hidden by forces that work hard to bury it, but the truth is always there, and it is our job in media to help it see the light of day. 
At PBS, we strive to present journalism with the highest standard of integrity, whether through a nightly program such as PBS NewsHour or an 18-hour documentary like the Vietnam War. While we present both news and point of view, we maintain a bright line between the two, and we are clear with our viewers about the difference. We also review our editorial standards on a regular basis to ensure that we're anticipating potential risk as new platforms evolve. And we work hard to avoid sensationalism. Last year, our system was recognized with more news and documentary Emmys than any other organization, as well as six Peabody Awards. Now, some may suggest that our programs aren't exciting enough to grasp people's attention, but we've found that many Americans are hungering for substance over soundbite. In fact, PBS has moved from the 15th most watched network to number six in the past decade, with our annual content budget that equals roughly what Netflix spends on one high-profile series, which was The Crown, by the way. <laughs> and PBS NewsHour and Washington Week have enjoyed their best ratings since 2009. We certainly aren't alone. There is outstanding journalism happening across the country. Consider the content recognized by this year's Pulitzers, from the intrepid work by The New Yorker and The New York Times, which helped to catalyze the Me Too movement, to exceptional reporting by local outlets, such as the Cincinnati Enquirer, which brought new light to the heroin e epidemic. Our shared challenge is to ensure that authentic journalism breaks through the noise and the clutter and rises above the vast amount of misinformation that exists today. Of course, the peddling of misinformation isn't entirely new. What is new is the democratization of content in which every person with a Twitter handle or Facebook account can become a purveyor of information. Every minute, more than 55,000 links are shared on Facebook and nearly half a million tweets are sent out into the stratosphere. Without an arbiter of the truth, falsehoods are created, quickly disseminated, and accepted as fact. Let me share one example. The Oxford Internet Institute studied Twitter accounts of Michigan voters leading up to the 2016 election. Their research found that misinformation was shared just as much as professionally researched journalism. And of the nearly 25,000 tweets that included links to political information, more than a quarter of those were deemed by researchers as propaganda or ideologically extreme and most of the tweets were falsely produced with the intent to persuade readers. We need new approaches to help the public distinguish between fact and fiction. The answer is not to suppress free speech, rather we must legitimize and elevate authentic journalism above the bots and the propagandists. The John S. and James L. Knight Foundation is doing important work in this space. Through their Commission on Trust, Media, and Democracy, they funded 20 initiatives aimed at addressing fake news and media literacy. For example, with support from Knight, the PBS NewsHour created NewsTracker.org uh, to investigate misinformation on social media. We're also seeing signs of progress among the leading digital platforms. Facebook, Twitter, and Google have recently made moves to differentiate between verified and unverified stories by using trust indicators, which help users to vet the reliability of publications and journalists. These are small steps, but, and there's still much work to be done, not only in journalism, but also in the matters of privacy and cybersecurity. We need to bring everyone around the table to establish new rules and editorial standards for this modern age, and we must work together to improve media literacy in this country. And that work begins in the classroom. For example, I'd like to highlight PBS member station KQED in San Francisco, which developed a certification that helps educators across the country to improve media literacy analysis and evaluation among their students. That is being made available to every classroom across the country, by the way. This brings me to my next point. We build trust by innovating with integrity. Some would argue that technological progress comes with unavoidable consequences, but I urge us not to conflate steady and stagnant. Consider the award-winning series Frontline. Executive producer Rainey Aronson Rath and her team were doing online journalism long before others. And in recent years, Frontline has been creating short-form content and posting on social media platforms. They've also been experimenting with virtual reality through which you can be transported to the melting ice caps in Greenland to see the effects of climate change, or immerse yourself in a refugee camp to understand the experience in a profoundly different way. 
but here's the important thing. As they've expanded their work in the digital sphere, Frontline hasn't strayed from their commitment to editorial integrity. They use the same thorough vetting process with social media posts as they do with full-length documentaries. In fact, Frontline has leveraged technology to set a new bar for transparency with a standard practice of publishing full interview transcripts online. And they use social media to create a more interactive and dynamic experience by bringing people into the conversation. This is another way we can build trust, using media to find common ground rather than using it to sow division. And this is where I think public media truly shines. As the people's network, our charge is to serve every community and every person, regardless of background or geography. And our local presence places us in a unique position to foster civil discourse. We gathered communities for discussions around the shootings in Newtown and Charleston. We held conversations on race and justice in Ferguson. And last fall, we brought people together to reflect on the Vietnam War. In conjunction with Ken Burns and Lynn Novick's documentary, stations across the country hosted events where veterans came face to face with peace activists and Vietnamese Americans, many of them for the very first time. It's an extraordinarily powerful moment proving that with careful attention and conversation, we can find common ground on even the most challenging of subjects. Our local presence also helps us to understand and address specific opportunities and challenges facing communities. Part of the distrust in media arises when journalists cover stories from afar because it is virtually impossible to understand both the depth and context without being part of a community. You've all had that experience of seeing a show, uh, of media coverage and wondering how they put that story together. If someone lives in a community and has a vested interest, their coverage is gonna be different than someone that just comes in, tries to quickly ground a, grab a sound bite, and goes away. And in public media, we build trust by demonstrating knowledge of and a vested interest in the communities we serve because our stations are very much a part of these communities. Americans believe that public broadcasting belongs to the public, the same way they feel about libraries, parks, and the public square. And they have a strong bond with their local station. I'd like to point to the exemplary work of Rich Hamburg and his Detroit Public Television. Rich and his team have gone into more than 15 communities across the metro area to host in-depth conversations with residents and stakeholders. Whether focusing on education in Brightmoor or housing in the Live Six neighborhood, DPTV is giving people a voice, helping them play an active role in rebuilding their community and strengthening local economy. And that brings me to my next point. If we truly want to just restore trust with the public, there has to be a sense that media is committed to the greater good and that we are on the side of the American public. There are many aspects of public media that engender trust, but none is more powerful than our work in early education. People trust us with the most important and precious part of their life, their children. They trust that we will care for them, offering them the potential and opportunity that should be the right of every child. I'd like to speak for a minute about a topic that connects two pillars of this conference, building trust and preparing Michigan's workforce for the future. We in public media are focused on early childhood education because we see it as a moral imperative and an economic imperative as we prepare children today for the jobs of tomorrow. All of the brain science research now affirms that the earliest years are among the most important in children's development. Whether through shows such as Odd Squad, which teaches kids about math and collaboration, or Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, which builds social emotional skills, every program we put on air is geared toward learning and discovery. For many families, public television is the only free educational resource before their children start kindergarten. And this holds especially true for low-income and underserved communities. Last year, we doubled down on our commitment to America's children by launching PBS Kids 24-7, the only free national kids broadcast service available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And 95% of US television households have access to the service now, including any household that has connection to the internet. I applaud PBS member stations in Michigan for being champions and early adopters of this game-changing service. The real impact of our work happens through local stations, which tailor their services to meet the unique needs of their communities. 
For example, Susie Elkins and the team at WKAR launched WKAR Family, which connects locally with caregivers and educators, equipping them with resources that improve learning outcomes for children in the community. They've also partnered with Michigan State to research the effectiveness of using tablets to increase math literacy among young children. This groundbreaking effort will serve as a model not just here in Michigan, but indeed for the country, and we're grateful for their work on it. We've seen time and time again that our impact is magnified through partnerships, whether with PNC Bank around their Grow Up Great campaign, or the Kellogg Foundation, which has invested heavily in PBS's work to boost learning in underserved communities. Our educational mission is rooted in the pioneering efforts of Fred Rogers. This year marked the 50th anniversary of the national broadcast of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and people across the country have been sharing stories about Fred's extraordinary impact. I'd like to share one story posted on social media by a woman named Bobby Craighead Hancock. She wrote, I grew up in poor rural Appalachia. My father was an alcoholic. Mr. Rogers was the first man I knew who talked calmly and quietly about real things, logical, intelligent, kind. I married an engineer. I'm an author. My oldest son is a biologist. My twins are studying to become a doctor and a physicist, all because of the difference PBS and Mr. Rogers made in the life of a child who was hungry for more than the gloom she knew. Fred Rogers believed that television can inspire children and unlock their boundless potential. He also believed in the power of media to serve as a positive force, a force that can help us achieve the great ideals for our country. Someone recently asked me if I feel demoralized by the state of television in America today. I said no. In fact, I believe this can be a golden age for television and indeed for all media. We have unprecedented opportunities to reach and engage people. Just consider that Detroit Public Television is live streaming this conference to reach exponentially more people than this theater can hold. New platforms are, building people, are bringing people together for important dialogue. Technology has enabled a new era of transparency as exemplified by the work of Frontline. And we're seeing a renewed commitment to localism as one example, a recently launched initiative called Report for America has deployed journalists in newsrooms around the country to report on undercover topics in communities, from Las Cruces, New Mexico, to Pike County, Kentucky. The model is similar to Teach for America and aspires to expand not only the journalism, but also the base of donors supporting local journalism. There are also promising efforts here in Michigan, such as the Detroit Journalism Cooperative, a partnership between Detroit Public Television, two NPR stations, Bridge Magazine, and a collection of multicultural newspapers and other local outlets. With support from Knight, Ford, and community foundations, these outlets are telling important stories about Detroit, shining a light on the progress and setbacks of this great and most American of cities. This effort speaks to the true potential of media. When it's good, media can entertain and inform. When it's great, media can transform communities and change lives. I believe that we can rebuild trust in media by elevating authentic news and public affairs, supporting local media and grassroots journalism, representing diverse viewpoints and experiences, and using media to educate and inspire people from all walks of life. The principles that I've discussed today of integrity and community harken back to that Jeffersonian idea that our democracy depends on an informed and engaged citizenry. No matter what role you play, whether you work in a corporation or in the state capital, in schools or in philanthropy, we all have a collective stake in restoring this trust. It is nothing less than essential to the future of Michigan and the future of our country. As you leave this conference, please know one thing, that PBS and your local stations are partners in this profoundly important endeavor. Thank you very much. Joining Paula Kruger on stage is the anchor for Detroit Public Television, Christy McDonald.
Paula. That was a wonderful speech. It was, it was good, especially I think um, everyone was touched by the Fred Rogers um, quotes and, and thinking about him for a lot of us that was our first foray into getting to know public television was through Fred Rogers and Sesame Street. And I think that that's what's also helped build the foundation of um, our fondness for, for public television mm -hmm. and the way it has changed kind of through all of our lives. But you talk a lot about trust in the media and once the media has lost the public's trust, it's gonna be very hard to get it back. And that's going to take, what I hear is time and money for media outlets, local television news, local newspapers who already feel the squeeze financially that yeah. they, can't, they can't keep up or they feel that they don't have that kind of time. Yeah, well, um, I'm sure it's gonna be a shock to everyone in this room. We've never been overfunded. And so um, <laughs> I, think that, um, I think that there is a false dichotomy between integrity of the work and what people actually are interested in. And you know, everyone that's involved in news knows the line, if it bleeds, it leads, and, and so forth. But I think we're at, a, we're at a unique moment where people truly are hungering for something different. And the fact that you know, little public television is now the sixth most watched, went from 15th to 6th. The fact that our audiences for NewsHour and, um, and series like Frontline are just growing exponentially, I think is, is, is reflective of the fact that, that people really want to understand the important issues. I think people are done with hearing about the Kardashians. I think they're done with hearing about things that are really not relevant. They're done with the circus. They really want to understand what are the facts? And one of the things we try very hard is not, we don't want to tell people what to think, we just want to give people information so they can make their own decisions. So I think that's one important thing. And I think the second is somehow we have to bring down the tenor of the conversation. Um, the late, uh, truly wonderful Gwen Eiffel used to always say, um, our goal should always bring, to, uh, bring light, not heat, to a conversation. And we have somehow lost the ability to bring people around the table and have conversation and come to the table recognizing that our opinion on something might change. And that's not a sign of weakness. And I think that's why convenings like this are so powerful and so important. The people in this room and the people that are listening uh, through the live stream are all people with a great stake in, in Michigan and the future of the state and by extension the future of the country. And if everyone is willing to come to the table with a sense of common purpose of trying to move our communities forward and to make decisions that will really benefit the whole, I think we have great hope for the future. And I think media has to play an important role in that. And so um, I, I'm very heartened by efforts to improve local journalism. Mm -hmm. I think the consequence of the reduction of, of reporters at the local level is just it's very clear. People read stories, they, they, they see that important issues and facts are left out. It's how could you possibly understand a community if you don't live in the community? And I think um, it's, it's much harder to distrust media if the um, storyteller is the person that's standing next to you on the soccer field watching their kid play with yours. Um, I think there's something to be said about trying to rebuild that. And I think that's what's very, been very difficult is that we've lost a lot of institutional knowledge. If you look at some of the newspapers and even local television news um, and, and the turnover, the people who do understand the community. Um, how do we get around the, the, um, the title of fake news that's still being thrown about for the last two or three years and the, the total distrust there and the breakdown of that label? Yeah, I mean, I think that, look, I think that Media, when it makes a mistake, should be called out, but I think that the consequence of diminishing journalism is significant. And so um, for us in, in public broadcasting, uh, we are focused on, and we are all rel relentlessly focused on the integrity of our work. Look, we've existed for more than 50 years because we exist on the philanthropy of people and communities that trust us. Once we lose trust, all, everything that is um, part of the support of public broadcasting collapses. You know, people don't support organizations they don't trust. And so for us, trust is the most important aspect of who we are. And I think that, um, you know, I think that we can all play a role in trying to counterbalance this environment that we're in that somehow all media is painted with a broad brush. 
No, I think that you know, media uh, you know, bears responsibility. I think there are a lot of media organizations that conflate news and point of view. Um, mm -hmm. I think media organizations can certainly do both. I think you need a bright line between the two. And you need to be very clear when you're reporting the news, and I think we're, you need to be very clear when you're reporting opinion. So I think there's work to be done on both sides. But I think, it's, I think the consequences of it we see, and it just breeds more that um, is, is not going to end in a happy place if we don't try to take, it, um, take care of it. I think what's really difficult is that sometimes when we <coughs> lump media all together, you're looking at CNN, and you're also comparing it to the New York Times, and you're comparing it to Channel 4, Channel 7 in your, in your hometown. And the Detroit Free Press and, and everything else. Exactly. And so you look at CNN, which has had so much, they have so much airtime to fill. And so their opinion or their talking heads then bleed into a long-form report that they're trying to do. And sometimes those lines do get blurred. In, in the viewership, they're not sure what they're what yeah. they're exactly watching, and and I think and then compounded with what people read online, mm -hmm. and uh, I, and so I think that um, you know again uh, the issue that uh, we've been spending a lot of time thinking about is is media literacy and how do we help the um, consumers of of information really discern fact from fiction. And I think that, again, that's an important effort that will enable us to rebuild trust. Um, I think that actually is what um, has contributed to part of um, the success that we've seen lately, because we have a brand that people trust. They understand what it is. And um, I'm heartened by the number of people that um, are tuning back to PBS that perhaps haven't been watching in the last few years. And, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, com some of them came back during Downton Abbey. But, uh, well. but uh, I, I think that um, it, you know, people recognize that it, it, it is a, we, we're providing a service. That's what the S in public in PBS stands for. And uh, that's, that's our goal. So the video that played before you came out, I couldn't help but notice the number of female correspondents that are on the news hour, along with Judy Woodruff, um, Christiane Amanpour, who's on there as well, and I'm sitting next to one of the few female CEOs in, in the country. Do you think that media organizations are doing a better job at bringing in more female leadership and management in the newsrooms? Well, I think that media is, um, it, it's, it's very important for media organizations to reflect the people that they serve. And I think it matters who is making the decision about what appears on air, as well as who is telling that story. And, um, and so we have um, uh, really focused uh, a good deal of effort in making sure that not only um, do we, are we looking in front of and behind the camera, but that we're also developing a next generation of talent. And so I think that for us, this has been an ongoing exercise. And um, you know, a lot of our producers are women. Uh, the executive producer of the News Hour is uh, Sarah Just, uh, executive producer of Frontline, Rainey Aronson, um, and you know, the, the the mother of Masterpiece Theater, Rebecca Eaton. Um, you know, so we have a lot of women that work in public broadcasting, and as well as a number of people of color. And I think that that has to be always something that you pay attention to as you're looking to find new storytellers, as you're looking to find new talent, and as across the country our stations are looking to recruit new executives. Um, I think it's interesting when people ask me, because I work for public television, they say, well, what are you working on? And I'll start talking about this long convoluted story, and sometimes I'll say, well, it's not totally sexy. Um, and, and I think that sometimes is the knock is the... But Christy, sometimes it is. But sometimes it is. <laughs> uh, but I think that sometimes has been the knock that people have about people PBS is they don't realize it. it's kind of the slow and steady, um, c bigger picture wins the race in, in, this, um, in, in this sort of atmosphere that they're in right now where people are starved for more information well, and, and longer form storytelling. I, I mean, I think we're not spinach. I mean, I, I think that uh, Well, we, now that's uh, interesting that you say that because some people would say, oh, you know, PBS, eat your vegetables, but no. No, I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, look, I mean, we're, we're, uh, we're in an entertainment medium, uh, not when we're in news. But um, so we do look for really wonderful and compelling stories that are, are fun, but they're smart. And I think that's always the, uh, that's always the great trick is to really figure out, you know, who is that next great storyteller and, and bringing them forward. Yeah. When I talk with media colleagues, sometimes we'll sit around and we'll talk about the state of, of news and media, and we wonder what it will be like 
in the next five years from now and how we're getting our information. What would you prognosticate on that? Oh, boy, if I could answer that question. I think that, uh, look, I think that the digital platforms are going to continue as, uh, as being an important source of information. I was just, I did an interview earlier today where, um, you know, we talked about perhaps the pendulum has swung too far one way and it's going to begin to right itself and that the, what has now been what's described as a wild west will start to uh, have a little bit of, um, of um, of centering, uh, but I do think that, um, I think radio and television will still be important forms. I see a great resurgence in print journalism, although most people may not be reading it on a printed piece of paper, but they may be reading it uh, through digital, and I see more collaborations between media organizations, which I think is fantastic. Okay, Paula Kerger, the CEO of PBS. Thank you very much.